the living, breathing Mark Twain, famously remarked that newspaper reports of his death were an exaggeration. I feel the same way about some commentators' pronouncements in the past year on Micro Four Thirds. No photographic systems are exactly thriving at the moment, I think probably due to two factors. Firstly, fewer first-time buyers, because mobile phone cameras are good enough. I take basic snaps on my mobile now, and while not knocked out with the quality, given the small screens I view them on, they'll certainly do. Once, if someone found they enjoyed image making on their mobile, they would have bought a compact camera and maybe upgraded from there. Secondly, the pioneering stage of digital photography is over. Three or four years ago, digital cameras reached a technical level good enough for even enthusiasts. Given the steep depreciation of used camera values and the rapidly rising prices of new ones, upgrading for incremental improvements doesn't look attractive. Micro Four Thirds suffers from all this, just as does APS-C and full-frame equipment. Bottom line, the camera industry, like the car industry, is suffering. Whatever, we are where we are, and far from being dead, the Micro Four Thirds system has been rather lively during 2019. My own year in photography has been rather a good one, so as far as I'm concerned, anyone who says Micro Four Thirds is dead can get stuffed. I finally got around to getting a hood for my 60mm Olympus macro lens, only six years after buying it. It'll be nice to have that instead of using my hand as a shield. Even then I was too mean to buy the official Olympus one at £44, and went for a JJC one at less than a tanner. I mean, what can an Olympus hood do that a JJC can't? And then there was a used Samyang 7.5mm f3.5 fisheye. I like to have a fisheye just to ring the changes, and it's useful for videos on my bike. I notice that over the years we've become so used to the fisheye perspective that it is hardly seen as distortion anymore. I suppose my most interesting exercise was the full-frame Panasonic S1, with its very sharp and capable 24 to 105 mm standard lens. It felt very familiar and very much a bigger version of the G9. It had been a while since I'd really used a full-frame camera but such was the similarity to the G9 that any differences in menu and control layout seemed only a matter of minor adaptation, much less than going from Panasonic GX9 to G9 or Olympus EM10 to EM1, say. My main feeling about the S1 surprised me in that I was disappointed by it, not by the camera itself or its performance. If you like the G9, you will certainly like the S1, and its image quality is every bit as good as you'd hope but disappointed by the overall equation. While the image quality of the S1 was better than the G9, it wasn't commensurately improved with the physical size and weight. There was an awful lot of extra metal there in order to get IQ, which, viewing with the display media I do, the biggest being a screen size of 27 inches with 4K resolution, was indistinguishable from its G9 stable mate. Go up to a 40 inch print and there would be a difference, but you'd need to look into the print to see it. And if you see someone doing that to one of your prints, the main message is that your picture has failed to capture the attention. I also found, so long after using full frame on a regular basis, that the shallower depth of field was more often a hindrance than a help. Often, you'd need to stop down to f8, where f4 would be finer micro four thirds. Of course, there are occasions when you do want shallow depth of field. I don't find that a problem with the smaller sensor, since I'm not a fetishist about it and usually using the 40 to 150 Olympus Pro lens at 2.8, or the little 45mm f-weight Olympus or Panasonic 25.14 will do the trick. Shallow depth with a small sensor and widish angle lens will always be a problem, of course. But Photoshop can do wonders here if you really must do things the hard way. Actually, you can get much smoother out-of-focus effects with Photoshop than you can with a lens. I know, I know. If it makes you feel better, those sloshing sounds you can hear, it's me washing my mouth out with soap and water. Then came the Panasonic G90, which was another example of a familiar pattern. The new version that is little more than a reheated version of the old one. The G90 is a very effective and desirable camera in its own right. Feels good, does everything well. But unless you find the 20 megapixel sensor irresistible, it's not an exciting upgrade from the G8085. Nice camera, but a bit of a price clash between it and the G9 and which the G9 must inevitably win, especially with the comprehensive version 2 firmware upgrade to focusing and video performance. The highlight of the year was the Panasonic 10-25mm f1.7 constant aperture wide to standard zoom. 
This brutally highlighted the micro four thirds conundrum. To what extent is it defined by its size? C'est magnifique, mais ce n'est pas le micro quatre tiers, as Marshal Bosquet might have said had he been observing bokeh rather than balaclava. This is a lens that probably couldn't be built for a larger format within reasonable size and price bounds. And I'm glad to see that Panasonic has the confidence in the format to introduce it. Its existence does not mean that all cheaper, smaller, wide standard zooms will be coming off the shelves. Neither does it imply any obligation to buy it. As a lens, it's superb, as you'd expect at the price. Personally, I've not used it out of doors much due to its size, but I find it excellent for video for the extra depth of field control. Spot or what? The next highlight was the Olympus EM5 Mark III. This much-anticipated middle-range model was as good, actually, better than I expected. Provided I ignored a couple of factors, that is. Small as it is, the camera is beautifully designed and contrives to feel as spacious as a full-size DSLR. That, and what I found to be the very effective phase detection focusing, made for an outstanding camera. If you could ignore the two Ps, price and plastic. The price puts it in direct competition with the street price of Olympus' own EM1 Mark II. And the plastic body just doesn't have the reassuring feel of old-school metal like the M1. This clip shows its bendability on the camera base compared to a metal-bodied and much cheaper Panasonic GX9. Plastic maybe probably is just as strong. It's certainly lighter, but the M5 Mark III just doesn't feel like a $1,200 or £1,000 camera. Olympus ignored the third P after price and plastic. It's perception. It's not as if they don't understand. The Pen F emphasised its vintage metal, read quality, construction. But I came to praise Olympus, not bury them. My last item is another of their products, my best buy of the year, the venerable by Micro Four Thirds standards vintage 12 to 50 mm power zoom. How odd that the glitzy 1700 quid Panasonic 10 to 25 F17 should be upstaged by a 95 quid eBay acquisition. I bought it mainly for my videos, where its smooth four times power zoom is great for bringing boring product shots to life. Combined with high-res files and the power of Photoshop, it gives a quite amazing combined zoom factor. I then remembered what a versatile out-and-about lens it was, and it now seems to be earning its keep for stills, too. To my mind, it's a tool like a lovely old Swiss army knife. I wonder if there's a sturdy metal lens hood for it. If there is, I could cut a notch in it and it could get the stones out of my horse's hooves as well. Thanks for watching.